This is just one of a series of things about HBO uh, putting on this month. So there are some opportunities and each one is unique. There will be a guided hike on Saturday by Chuck with the Liz sure. along at Mona Blue. That has worked between the Mind Health and Laboratory and HBO and then we finished it up here with Fox. And with that, I'll turn it over to Liz Bridger. <laughs> All right, thanks so much for that great introduction and thank you all for being here on a Wednesday night. I'm thrilled to see so many of us online. Um, I should say that I am one of probably 10 people in this room that could be up here to give you this talk. Um, as we all remember from college or high school science courses, um, labs are inherently um, collaborative, right? And they, they involve lab partners or lab groups. And so we're gonna, I'm gonna hopefully emphasize this sort of group effort nature uh, as I discuss some of these things today. So as um, Megan kindly mentioned, I'm a, a research geologist at the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory and I've been here um, just for a couple of years now, but a little more specifically, I consider myself a petrologist. So I study rocks and minerals to better understand how they form. And here in Hawaii, we do this quite often every time the volcanoes erupt, of course, but also looking back at the very long, older histories of these volcanoes. And my research includes quite a lot of, of field work, followed by a tremendous amount of work in the laboratory. And that's both processing samples, but also conducting analytical work. Um, so we focus a lot on chemistry, and that's what this talk will highlight today. And I really, really love studying the mineral olivine. And so it's the most common mineral on planet Earth and actually in our solar system. And if you are ever out for a hike, it doesn't matter where you are on this island, chances are somewhere, some lava flow near you has these little green minerals in it. And those little green minerals are the olivine crystals. And if we have any August birthdays in the room, um, your, <laughs> your birthstone is called peridot, which is the gem quality variety of olivine. So for all you August birthdays, olivine is your jam. <clears throat> but like I said, this is all just full of teamwork. And so I, I would be remiss if I didn't start by introducing some of these other folks. There's a tremendous amount of support from UHH faculty and students, uh, many of whom are in this room. I won't, uh, won't call you out, I suppose. Um, but we enjoy lots of cross-disciplinary collaborations and laboratory um, work, including with our partners at CSAVE as well, and we'll touch on that in a moment. Um, one of the things I'd really like to highlight, though, is that our work is also um, supported by the tremendous efforts of an undergraduate student, usually from the geology department, and that undergraduate student is trained up in all of our lab procedures, and they are an integral part of our eruption response and our research that we conduct. And then over on the HBO side, of course, there's myself and some other research geologists, Drew Downs. Um, our numbers are growing. Um, Bailey McDade, I wanted to highlight, um, is a UHH geology alumnus. And um, she is now, as of yesterday, been hired to be HBO's physical science technician uh, for six months and to help us with all this lab stuff. So it's really nice to see students going through the departments and ending up um, working with HBO long term, not just as the cooperative um, petrology students. So, um, this is a nice photo of Bailey uh, being really excited about Mount Aloha 22 lavas. Um, and so <clears throat> there are, are probably 20 more names that should have been on this list, folks that still collaborate with us and or very recent um, alums from our, our group. But I did just want to um, acknowledge that, like I said, I'm, I'm not the only one that could be up here giving this talk. And so moving on from the people, um, we can start just with a, a basic dis description of sort of what this cooperative agreement looks like. And so the, the RCUH um, co-op structure was created actually um, in the late 90s. And so it's an agreement between the USGS, um, including HBO, and also the University of Hawaii. And through this cooperative agreement, there are a number of programs that thrive, including the Center for the Study of Active Volcanoes, um, CSAVE shown here, and HBO hires a number of our staff members through the RCUH um, cooperative. So um, deformation specialists and seismic analysts and all kinds of different um, expertise at HBO. Um, we really, really, um, erupt with gratitude for our uh, co-op partners. And so this was a really nice recent, um, I think in the last two years, recent Volcano Watch that was written about this relationship, if you're curious to know more, but it has a long, um, long past. And um, 
the geochemistry side of, of these things, I believe started in 2012. Um, Cheryl Gansek, who's nodding at me, so that <laughs> must be pretty close. And she did, um, she did lay um, quite a lot of the foundational work for this. And in, in laying that foundation, Cheryl and Steve and Peter Mills and others, um, one of the first instruments to be included in this arsenal of tools that we use is our EDXRF. So these uh, letters in this acronym stand for Energy Dispersive X-ray Fluorescence. And so this is the EDXRF instrument. And then you can see the computer screen here is showing a readout of the data as it's being measured. And our um, RCUH colleague, Mickey Warren, running this instrument. Now the EDXRF is really helpful because we can conduct rapid geochemical analyses in less than a day. It's also got really easy sample preparation in the laboratory, it's easy to operate, and we can provide timely information for different uh, stakeholders regarding ongoing eruptions, as well as build databases for these volcanoes on which to make comparisons. And this was really kind of the beginning of this near real-time chemistry and the cooperative laboratory agreement. Uh, I mentioned before, we have an undergraduate uh, petrology student worker. Um, this student is um, paid for 10 hours uh, a week during um, the regular semester. Obviously, coursework comes first. And then I believe they're allowed to work um, half time during breaks uh, and over the summer, for example. Uh, the student is trained by um, UHH and HBO colleagues. They become a completely independent lab user after all of our training, and we rely heavily on their expertise um, to collect data uh, for our projects. And um, I, I just, I, I can't say it enough. You know, we really love these students. We love having them around. And it's really nice to be able to work with them on a daily basis. <clears throat> uh, so as, we, as I sort of outlined for you how this process works and what the student does and, and what we all do, the first thing we have to do is give a shout out to the field crews. So you can't analyze samples if they weren't collected, right? So step one go out and find the samples. And whether this is um, an active lava flow from a current eruption, or maybe you've done some mapping on the volcanoes and they're older samples, you have to go out and collect those samples. So here's just a number of, of recent um, sample collection images from HVO's efforts. Uh, these are all from um, recent eruptions at Kilauea. And so um, many of our cooperative partners are also HVO volunteers and participate in those sampling efforts with us. So step one, go and find a rock. <clears throat> and then what happens? So those samples come back to the lab, and one of the very first things that any good scientist does is document, document, document. Take notes, record the metadata, give the sample a proper name and number that's queryable through time so that 10, 20 years from now, somebody who might be interested can go back and find that sample, right? So metadata and just being really you know, detailed is, uh, is really step one. And while we're doing that, the samples can be drying in the ovens. So even if it you know, hasn't been raining, um, volcanoes degas liquids and volatiles, right, including H, uh, H2O. So we do throw these guys in the oven uh, to make sure that they are dry. And then our cooperative student um, is the first one to work with the sample. They take a split. And basically that means if you have a sample the size of a bag of cereal, right, you want to make sure that you take half of it and put it you know, save it for later analyses. And then you, you cut, you know, the remainder in half again, right? And you start parsing out portions of this sample to be analyzed in different ways. We also wanna make sure that if anyone in our community wants to replicate our work, that there's available sample splits so that they could repeat the process. Um, so we, we split the sample several times. Of course, one of the first things that we do is to use that great EDXRF instrument to get the chemistry, some basic chemistry on the sample. At the same time, we send an equivalent split to a lab on the mainland for WDXRF. It's a different letter in the acronym, and it just means wavelength dispersive. It, essentially, it's an instrument that has um, higher precision, but takes a whole lot longer to get those data, right? So there's trade-offs. If you want really precise data, you might not be able to get it within one day, and therefore it can't be helpful for informing about what the eruption's doing. So the EDXRF is really our key tool for this you know, quick, um, analysis to, to know what we're working with. And the WDXRF is often, you know, a few months later we get the, those data back. And they very frequently confirm the results from the EDXRF effort. Um, we also take some of these splits and we crush, sieve, and pick them for minerals. My favorite being olivine, of course, but Hawaiian volcanoes have plagioclase, they have pyroxenes, there's all kinds of things that you can find in these samples. And in fact, some of our students that are helping us pick are in this room and uh, have been doing a really amazing job helping us to identify these minerals. <clears throat> we also do share samples. So we take um, 
requests from collaborators and we send samples um, to all different kinds of folks who want to do different types of geochemical analysis that maybe we can't do here uh, in Hilo. And then we um, also utilize our SEM, scanning electron microscope. Um, we'll talk about that a, a little bit more in a few slides, but that lives in the Marine Science Building. So we go up and hang out with the marine scientists a bit, use the SEM and take a look at what the sample actually looks like, and we can get some chemistry there too. So lots of different things, and our, our laboratory student often makes sure that this list is um, followed very carefully. And so at this point, you're probably asking, well, why bother? What, what is so important about getting chemistry in a day? Why does it matter? So we're going to actually talk about a little bit of chemistry today, but I promise it won't be that painful. This is one example that I'm showing you, but there are several ways that you can do this. So this figure shows the magnesium, or the MGO, content in lavas from Hawaii. Temperature in degrees Celsius is on the x-axis, and in hindsight, I probably should have converted that to Fahrenheit. I apologize. But 1,200 degrees C is roughly 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit, okay? Just to give you some context. So when we analyze these samples, we can get information on the magnesium or the calcium. Calcium is another one not shown here, but is also very helpful. These elements are really cool because they're very sensitive to temperature. So even though we might not have been there to actually measure the temperature of the erupting lava or tephra or material, we can measure the chemistry and interpolate what the temperature was, right? And so this is um, one of our like first pass basic primary tools that we use to assess when a new eruption starts. Well, how fresh is the magma? How new is it in the volcano? How hot is it? And we can do that by getting at the magnesium content. And you can see there's this really nice, convincing, linear array of increasing MGO equals hotter temperatures, higher temperatures, right? Hotter magmas. And this has been determined experimentally for decades, and there was a, a new contribution that came out um, for Hawaiian rocks um, that applies to Kilauea and Mauna Loa. So we can do this at all of our volcanoes, not just Kilauea. So what other kinds of data are important? Well, one other example shown here is potassium on the y-axis, and then this is eruptive year on the x-axis here. So we're looking at a time series of data. Potassium is a minor element in erupted lavas. So um, it's in, you know, sort of like the 0.4 weight percent range. Um, I didn't say it explicitly, but these uh, MGO contents on this previous slide, those are in the 5% range, right? So much, much higher concentrations. So we can use things that are in low concentrations to look at changes over time because things like potassium or titanium or zirconium, lots of different elements, can actually be used to fingerprint where magmas are coming from. So they preserve these signatures of what types of rock have melted to create that magma that has then erupted. And if you look at these changes over time, these are data for the Pu'uo'o eruption, starting in about 1985 here, um, all the way through to its end in 2018. Those are the black triangles. And the gray circles are the summit lava lake from 2008 to 2018, the Halemaumau lava lake. And you can see this potassium decreases and then increases and decreases again, and it kind of wobbles around. But over the course of the Pu'uo eruption, it really dropped pretty dramatically. So this is telling us that over that 35 plus year period, Pu'uo was being sourced by rocks that were changing, right? Their chemistry was just a little bit different over time. And so these are the kinds of things that we look for in our rapid analyses less than a day to help inform what's going on. Mostly we ask this question, especially right now at Kilauea, well, is it the same or is it different? Are we looking at a continuation of the same type of activity that we've seen, or is this something totally new? And we'll get to those examples in a minute. First, um, I think the best example that's laid out um, is uh, looking back at Kilauea's 2018 eruption. And I'm sure that most of you in this room do not need the reminder. It was um, quite a dramatic event and sadly the most destructive eruption in Hawaii. Um, this eruption, which lasted almost four months, provided many, many opportunities for sampling. And um, full disclosure, I was not an employee at the USGS at this time. So all the work I'm about to show you is, you know, Cheryl and Steve and all the folks that were here before me. So this is not my work, but you're going to see how important it is. Um, during this time, using the EDXRF, these folks at UHH really put this methodology to the test. They were able to go from a rock to data out of the instrument 
in about one to two hours on the fast end, which is really, really cool. And those analyses were conducted within about 24 hours of sample collection, right? So you physically pick up the sample and the clocks kind of start. So you have to drive it back to the lab, you have to put it in the oven, you have to get it ready, you have to crush it. But the analysis itself, you know, really didn't take um, too much time, which was really informative during those events in 2018. And the figures I'm about to show you now are from a um, published research paper, um, excuse me, using these data. And this was one of the first times in our scientific community that um, we were documenting how petrology and geochemistry could be used as an active monitoring tool, like really demonstrating how it would be put into practice by volcano observatories or by interested parties um, during an eruption. And so on this particular diagram, I've shown you this time instead the calcium, but remember both calcium and magnesium are sensitive to temperature. So basically as calcium goes up, temperature goes up. The x-axis is days since the start of the 2018 eruption, right? So early products from the 2018 eruption were lower in calcium and therefore rather cooler magmas overall. And as the eruption progressed and the infamous um, fissure eight was established, calcium increased telling the observatory scientists at that time and the UH scientists that um, hotter, fresher magma was starting to arrive in the lower East Rift Zone, right? That this eruption was evolving. It was not homogeneous, things were changing. And that was um, really, really important to, to think about because hotter magmas tend to have, um, uh, they're more runny, right? So their viscosities are different. The lava flows might travel further. There's lots of implications for having a hotter magma uh, be erupted. Um, they also looked at the um, trace elements. So this is a, another plot um, showing that zirconium, which is a trace element. Remember, that's the one that fingerprints the mantle source. Um, and in this plot, the important thing to just take a look at is the blue squares compared to the gray field. Right, so the 2018 eruption followed closely after the collapse of Pu'u'o and the end of that remarkable decades long eruption. And one of the first things that people were asking, is it the same or is it different, right? Is this Pu'u'o material that has simply moved down the rift and then erupted? Well, the short answer and the near real time chemistry answer was no, it's not really the same. These zirconium values are a lot higher than this gray field that represents Pu'u'o from 2016 to 2018. And so this was another indication that something at Kilauea was fundamentally different, that these events were not just structural failures, but that there were other things happening and the chemistry was giving us insights into that. Um, if you are interested, I believe that this is open access, this paper, and can be found um, in Science Magazine. And it's a really beautiful example of how um, this cooperative partnership led to really tremendous scientific advances, um, not just for us, but in fact, globally. One of the best things for me, I was not at HBO at the time, but I was watching all of this unfold in my scientific community. I really enjoyed seeing just the outpouring of interest related to this methodology that had been developed in this partnership. Very soon in our scientific journals, we saw one after another examples of other eruptions around the world where other observatories had picked up on this technique, had honed it best for their system, and were starting to publish also these sort of real-time monitoring and insights. So not only did HBO and UHH really set the stage globally, but I think they've sparked a revolution in the sense that this is, is a new cutting edge tool that's being used around the world. And it's being used so frequently that we're now learning from the other observatories too in refining our approach. And I just, I just find that to be an incredibly exciting time to be a scientist, uh, generally. Uh, in the wake of the 2018 eruption, there were also several other um, changes. So we're gonna transition more towards recent eruptions. Um, one of the big things that happened um, was that um, Congress allocated a supplemental funding package for um, HVO and also the, the Pierce um, USGS Biology Group. And this supplemental funding package has made incredible investments in the laboratory capabilities of UHH and of HVO. One of the best ones, the ones I'm excited about, is a wavelength dispersive spectrometer addition to our SEM up in marine science. So with this additional, um, effectively it's a, an arm that kind of plugs into the instrument and it allows you to do more. And you can get faster analyses, they're quantitative, and um, 
you know, we're, we're sort of hoping that we can come up on this, the data within 24 hours time frame, just like the EDXRF. And as a side note, traditionally to get this type of data, you would have to ship samples to the mainland or you'd have to pay for a much more expensive instrument. Um, we don't have to do that now. And we just need to practice with this instrument and the, its new gadget. And um, very soon we will be able to produce these data very quickly. Uh, and so that's something we're very excited about. And that was just one of many new critical laboratory investments made by the supplement. Um, we've outfitted both UHH and HVO lab spaces with brand new microscopes. We have a state-of-the-art powdering, polishing, and sample prep facility. Um, I'm really excited. We also have a physical volcanology lab, so we can do all kinds of physical measurements outside of the chemistry. Um, it's a very exciting time to, to be developing new, new methodologies um, in this partnership. Which brings us to the recent eruptions and some examples of where this new instrumentation has gotten us and the kinds of things that we're trying to do. This, as my supervisor says, is where the rubber meets the road, right? This is where putting this into practice really matters, just like the example of 2018. So as many of you hopefully know, um, after an approximately two-year hiatus, um, Kilauea erupted again in December of 2020. Uh, fissures opened up in the walls of Halima'uma'u Crater, the collapsed crater from 2018. And um, that opening phase of activity, these fountains shown here on the top uh, picture, actually were powerful enough to spread tephra, which is just a word we use for airborne pieces of, of lava and minerals and things. Um, it spread tephra onto the landscape where the old um, chain of, not chain of crater, sorry, the, the old crater rim tribe uh, comes around on the south side of the crater. And so with um, close collaboration with the National Park Service um, and, and lots of PPE and safety, um, we were able to come out to this road surface and scoop up this brand new material. And I bet you can guess what my first question was. Is it the same or is it different? And also, yes, is there olivine? <laughs> that, was, that was absolutely a question. <laughs> and so one of the first things we did was to process this sample. Of course, we did the EDXRF, and we're going to come back to that. Um, but now I'd like to showcase some of the ways that we can use our scanning electron microscope. So this is called a BSE image, backscattered electrons. Essentially, it's a grayscale picture of a piece of rock. The gray tells you a little bit about the composition. Effectively, areas in this picture that are dark are areas that have very little iron in them, right? So they're low in iron, the atomic number is low, and they end up being quite dark. Conversely, areas that are bright, you see all these bright squiggles here, and there's sort of a medium gray color there, those are um, substances or portions of the rock where um, there's a high atomic number, and we infer that there is more iron present in that part of the rock than in the others, okay? So all you have to remember about these pictures is that bright stuff is rich in iron, okay? And you can make some really basic chemical inferences just by looking at these pictures. So one of our first uh, tasks using this 2020 eruption tephra was to figure out what it was made of. So this first example that I, that I showed you, um, this is actually a sort of gross, recycled, altered piece of wall rock, right? So when the 2018 uh, summit collapses were occurring, a lot of that rock was pulverized into fine, fine pieces in the collapse pit. And we know that Kilauea's summit is also quite warm, that there's a hydrothermal system there. And the hydrothermal system tends to alter those lavas, right? It cooks them, it changes their chemistry, and you get a lot of secondary minerals that come in and sort of replace the original lava. And that's kind of what this is. It's a, it's a bit of a, a, a mess of things. Um, a lot of it um, contains sulfur, a lot of it contains gypsum, and those are two minerals that can be found you know, in the geothermal areas at Kilauea. So nothing surprising mineralogically, but it was interesting that these altered pieces of the crater wall were covered you can see here little bits of fresh magma, right? So the fountains ripped up parts of the crater and threw it out, which was unexpected for me anyway. Uh, some of the stuff that we cared a little bit more about because we want to know more about the magma, um, these are two examples, two BSE images of um, juvenile, what we call juvenile material. Basically, that's the fresh stuff. The fresh magma that came up was erupted, the fresh lavas that were quenched. 
And you can see, just comparing the top picture and the bottom picture, they look pretty different, right? There are two different textures here. The top one is mostly glassy, sort of a uniform gray color. The bottom one is chock full of little minerals. And the scale bars on these things, remember, we're in a high-powered electron microscope. So this is 100 microns. So if you've got hair on your head, one single strand of hair, roughly, is about 100 microns. Okay, so we're looking at really, really small stuff here. These are tiny, tiny little minerals. And they're, you know, something like less than a tenth of a millimeter, or if you think in inches, something quite, quite small <laughs> in inches. Um, and this was really important because it looked like there were maybe two different magmas at play in the 2020 eruption. And we could tell that just based on these pictures. The eruption also spit out what we think are gabbro clots. Gabbro is just a rock name. It's basically mush, right? Lots of crystals mushing around, very little liquid. And you can see here these really big, bright, iron-rich minerals compared to these darker grays. So there's probably three or four different minerals that make up this cloth. And we believe that these things, these mushy, mineralic things, probably come from older pockets of stored magma that have had a little bit more time to evolve and crystallize. So this eruption also brought up some older stuff, which was interesting. And yes, there were olivine, thankfully. Uh, <laughs> so um, these BSC images, you know, I, I've shown you a variety of different textures and different types of materials, but for me, they really are informative when looking at the olivine crystals. So when you go out and you find a lava and it's got those green, bright green specks in it, if you could put those specks into a scanning electron microscope, you might find that they are chemically zoned. So this guy in the upper left, just gray. He's chilling. He's one composition, right? Same color gray across the whole crystal. But if you look at these three other examples I've given you, this one has a dark interior and a light rim. This one has a light interior and a dark rim. This one's got light, dark, light. So just by using the BSC images, we can already say, wow, there's a huge diversity in the compositions of these crystals that came out in one eruption. And that's telling us something about how many magmas might have been at play here before the eruption started. Crystals that live together tend to look the same, right? So the fact that there's such diversity here suggests that they all came from different places in the volcano. They ended up in the same place and were erupted together, but they came from different parts. So leveraging this information is one of the ways moving forward that we hope to develop other UHH HVO co-op strategies for some quick information during eruption monitoring. And we certainly did use this information at the time in 2020. And then of course, as you know, Kilauea has kept us very busy in the last several years. So one more example from the um, September 2021 eruption. This eruption did last many months into 2022. Um, but this, this is an example of um, very frothy pumice that was erupted at the start of that eruption, right? And so if you remember a few slides ago, I showed you uh, the crater rim drive covered in these tiny little bits of tephra. This is very different. I mean, the scale here is something like um, so that's in centimeters, like 11 centimeters. You're, you're talking like at least six inches, right, or more for a lot of these pieces of lava that were thrown up and out of the crater. And so this second eruption at Kilauea instantaneously told us that things were a little bit different, right? And when we look using the SEM images, we can see that, you know, things are, some, some things are similar and some things are different. So we have our, you know, homogeneous, one gray color crystal here, and then you know these guys that are zoned. But the kicker was for the September 21 eruption, we only saw fresh magma, right? There was none of the altered wall rock, none of the gabbros that we've found so far, um, you know, none of those, those other things that made the 2020 eruption so messy. And so already, between the space of two events following the 2018 uh, uh, summit collapse, we've seen major changes at Kilauea. And very briefly, um, to show you that indeed these things are different, you can actually measure those olivines and you know, the dark versus the light colors in the grayscale images do translate to chemistries. So on these figures, I've basically just shown you um, for 2020 on the left and 2021 on the right, the olivine forstrite. Forstrite is just a fancy word that means 
the amount of magnesium relative to the amount of iron in the sample. And so the 2020 and the 2021 olivines, these two figures look pretty similar, right? You've got a big gray peak at four straight 82, another big gray peak at four straight 82, and then this dark peak at 88, and again, a dark peak at 88, right? So a lot of the chemistry of the solid materials of these minerals is actually the same from one eruption to the next. So using all of this information, we can actually piece together where magmas moved inside the volcano. And sometimes the pathways are the same. They pick up the same type of solid materials. And there's a whole lot more that goes into that, but for the purposes of today, these are just sort of highlights of the different ways that we're trying to use mineral information moving forward in addition to the EDXRF analyses. And of course, as you know, 2023 was very busy. We had three eruptions at Kilauea, and the short presentation on that is that it's a work in progress. <laughs> uh, I, I can't express enough how we can't keep up. Um, that, like I said, it's group effort and it's a tremendous amount of work. We cannot keep up sometimes. Um, but we do have the EDXRF results, which I will show you here. So we had looked at an early version of this plot, right, when I explained the use of, of um, MGO and, and variations over time. Um, the blue diamonds here, that's Pu'u'o'o. The white circles, that's the Halima'uma'u 2008 to 2018 lava lake. And then the 2018 eruption on the Lower East Rift Zone is this big range in the gray diamonds, yeah? And these are all of the new eruptions. So in yellow is December 2020, in orange is September 21, red is January 2023, and green is June 2023, and September is still pending. These are the WDXRF data so that we could look at a bigger time span, and we don't have those data back yet for the eruption that occurred in September. Underscoring the importance of having EDXRF because it's been how many months and we still don't have those data back from the mainland lab, right? But the nice thing is if I were to hedge my bets about what the September composition looks like. It's probably something very similar, right, to 2020, 21, 23. Uh, you know, all these things are showing sort of the same information. They're a little bit warmer, a little bit hotter, right, than the old lava lake in Halima'uma'u. And they're a little bit higher, you know, than the end of the Pu'u'u'u eruption, but lower than 2018 Lower East Rift Zone. If we take another look uh, at the potassium, right, another one of our minor trace elements looking for changes in melting uh, of the rocks down in the mantle, um, you can see that our recent eruptions uh, have potassium kind of at, you know, this level, very similar to 2018 Lower East Rift Zone, both of which are higher than previous summit eruptions. So while this is um, a study that's ongoing and involves many different types of data, for which I am not the expert. What I can say is from these data sets, it looks like something changed at Kilauea in 2018, right? And that we are seeing that same flavor at the summit today. And that's something that's kind of interesting. And um, we hope through many additional studies of our academic partners and others interested in this topic that we will have a better understanding of what that change is and why. It's only been, you know, five or so years since the uh, events of 2018, and these things um, often take an entire student's graduate time to, to unravel. So we're, we're eagerly awaiting more information about what this means. In some of my remaining time, I'm just gonna briefly contrast those examples with the Mount Aloha 22 eruption. So after over 38 years of repose, Mount Aloha uh, sprang back to life in November of 2022. The summit began, uh, or sorry, the eruption began in the summit, Moko Veo Veo, and was only active there overnight for about six hours. And by the early morning hours on the 28th, the eruption had migrated into the upper northeast rift zone. And this was an exciting time scientifically because it was our first chance to better understand Mount Aloha's plumbing system in almost 40 years. And so all hands on deck in the lab for this um, quite unprecedented eruption in our lifetimes. And um, everybody came in and supported that lab effort. Um, and I hope when you look at this plot, you agree with me that it doesn't look like Kilauea 2018, right? 
Here's our magnesium and our calcium, our temperature indicators, and they are flat, no changes, right? So this is time on the x-axis, the approximately two weeks of the eruption. We had a great time series of samples running those EDXRF analyses, and everything was exactly the same. And in fact, on this plot are also the early summit samples in the summit crater and things down on the northeast drift zone. So you've got 19 kilometers of eruptive fissures and two weeks of an eruption, and they're all the same. It's totally different from what they saw for the Kilauea Lower East Drift Zone eruption in 2018. And it was a little surprising. That wasn't maybe what we expected. And it turns out um, there are some serious questions raised by these rather boring results otherwise. How do you erupt that much magma that's all the same composition? Where do you store it? How much is that? I, what is the size of Mount Oloa's reservoir? We, these are all exciting questions that come out of a data set that is otherwise unremarkable. <laughs> what was nice at the time was that uh, our UHH partners got to showcase a longer term data set for Mount Oloa that was put together by uh, a UHH geology department alum, uh, Will Wooten. So he had done uh, quite a lot of work um, with the UHH faculty to look at EDXRF analyses of Mount Oloa eruptions from 1823 to present. And so they already had this great database and they plopped those 2022 samples onto these figures and they could instantly say, is it the same or is it different? So not only is 2022 really homogeneous, but it's also the same basically as the 1984 eruption. So these were pieces of information that we were able to get uh, probably within 48 hours of the start of the eruption. We were starting to make these comparisons to say like, whoa, Mount Oloa has come back to life and it's actually the same as it was in 1984. What does that mean, right? So um, in real time, these things are super helpful. And um, the one other thing that I'll say about sort of our real time efforts, right? We, we've, we place this emphasis on getting certain information quickly to make decisions or make informed um, interpretations. But there is something to be said for the balance of that quick near real time chemistry and longer term research. So during this eruption, during that two weeks, myself, my colleagues in the lab, it was very, very sad. We couldn't find any olivine crystals. I was devastated. And we, at the time, you know, we really thought that these things might be aphiric. So aphiric meaning no minerals. Um, this is one of those backscatter images with the tiny, tiny crystals. We saw a lot of those little, little crystals, but nothing like an olivine crystal that you could see with the naked eye. And so we said, oh, there's, there's no minerals in here, that's a bummer. But I was persistent. <laughs> and after crushing, sieving, and picking many trash cans worth of volume of tephra, we have found extremely rare olivine crystals. So, you know, we've been through many trash cans volume and I have 60 olivine crystals that are about the size of a millimeter, right? Needle in a haystack, am I right? But they're super important. Right? They're telling us a part of the story that we never would have gotten in near real time because it takes time to process these samples. And this is the power of the collaborative teamwork in all of us rotating through the crushing, sieving, picking, and our amazing undergraduate students that have helped us with this. So this is kind of a new, um, new in the last year discovery with this eruption. We're learning a lot about these crystals and what they can tell us about Mount Loa. And it really, for me, as a, as a young scientist, emphasizes the balance, the importance of balance, right, between the near real time approach and the longer term research approach. Both are needed to fully understand these systems. And in my final few minutes, I just wanna touch on beyond eruptions. What are the other amazing things that are coming out of this partnership? One is that we are striving to make these data publicly available and downloadable very, very soon after collection. So Drew Downs, uh, at HBO put together this data release. It includes all of the EDXRF data from the Mount Oloa 22 eruption, and it was published in the spring of 2023. So just a couple months after the eruption had ended, we'd gotten our data out. This is open and accessible for anyone to download. I am trying to work on a, a similar one for Kilauea, but every time I get close, it erupts again. <laughs> so we hope that this year in 2024, we will release Kilauea data and be able to update it with each new eruption. And that is the goal, is to make our data freely available. Um, the co-op also offers opportunities to foster student research and partnerships. Um, Alice Martin is a department uh, alum who's now a PhD student at the U of M Twin Cities. 
Um, she did an amazing study on density and vesicularity of the 2018 eruption with one of our colleagues. Uh, she's just one example of many successful students that have gotten to pursue independent research as a result of the cooperative agreement. Uh, Bailey McDade, who I mentioned, is our new science um, uh, technician at HBO. Um, she also worked on um, Mount Loa eruptions with me and is continuing to do that research in her new role at HBO. We are we are working very hard to expand student opportunities. Um, folks have always been able to sort of volunteer with us, but I believe that um, students should be paid for their time and their efforts. And so we actually had a meeting today with the UHH Pipes program folks, and we are gonna start um, offering lab um, opportunities through the co-op to include Pipes students um, from UHH. And um, we have faculty in the department that are eager to help us to uh, pursue other avenues, like nominating UHH undergrads for um, the NAGET Fellowship, the National Association of Geoscience Teachers. They do a paid internship with the USGS. So finding ways to make these laboratory projects on our recent eruptions accessible to students and they're paid, which for me is a big part of, of my motivation. And this summer, I hope, if everything works out, we're gonna have two of these students come on board and they're gonna help us catch up on those three eruptions from 2023. Finally, I will leave you with this notion that we are constantly learning. So one of the things that I am trying to do now is to use these Olivine BSC images in near real time. It's a totally different talk, so I won't you know, get into the details, but basically these little olivine crystals are stopwatches. They record time and can tell you how long magmas have sat around before they erupt. And if you know a little bit of math, a little bit of computer coding, and you can interrogate these grayscale images, you can actually get time which is very, very cool. And normally to do that is a lengthy process that involves multiple instruments and lots of time, and it's, it's not a very quick thing. But with one of the undergraduate students that's working with us, she's testing a method where you can do this in a couple of hours. Same type of near real time approach, and her results are very promising. For this particular example, my long arduous method gave a time scale of 60 days, and her very fast grayscale method gave the same result. So I will leave you with that tantalizing future notion that we are still learning, we're still growing, and um, mostly mahalo to UHH and all the people here who have been great lab partners, and we hope that we can continue to grow with you. Thanks. And I'm totally happy to take questions or talk story, whatever. Yeah. Any questions for Sandra? Yeah, please. The last bit, age of the lava was olivine. Yeah, very interesting. What, I mean, a little more detail, because olivine seems like a really hard crystal. Excellent so question. Crystal. Yeah, so, um, Yes, I can repeat the question. Um, so the question was in, um, asking me to clarify this slide, um, whether or not these olivine crystals are truly getting at ages or lava ages. So this is a very different technique that is independent from things like carbon dating that gives you a how old is this thing. This technique with the crystals is more how long did this last. The crystal might be five years old, but this zoning records the most recent event inside the volcano before it erupted, right? And so the 60 days timescale in this example, 60 days prior to eruption, this crystal was moved from one part of the volcano to another. It might have lived in the first environment for years. We don't get that information using this technique. We get the when are magmas moving prior to eruption. And depending on the elements you choose to interrogate, you can get timescales as short as seconds, like during ascent to erupt, you can also get some time scales as long as, um, I would say probably decades, because our temperatures are pretty hot in these basaltic volcanoes. So it just kind of depends on what the crystals are recording in terms of what kind of time information they give you. It is not an absolute age though. How do you know this? <laughs> Another excellent question, how do we know this? How can we use these little things as stopwatches? Um, and this, like I said, um, sort of tantalizing way to end, and unfortunately a whole nother hour long talk, but through a number of 
observations of natural samples and natural processes at well-studied volcanoes like this one in combination with experiments, so well-controlled experiments in laboratories across the world, we know how fast the atoms are jumping in the atomic lattice of the mineral. Base, and that's temperature dependent, right? So when it's really, really hot, those atoms move a lot faster. And when it's cooler, they move slower. So if you know something about the composition, either from grayscale or an, or an analysis, you know something about the temperature, hey, we've got our MgO and our calcium, right? You can piece these things together and use um, diffusion equations, foundational mathematic equations, um, to actually run a simulation to recreate what you've measured. You find a best fit to that and it gives you a time scale. And certainly there are uncertainties on these numbers. It's not just 60 days, it's 60 plus minus some amount. So you're really getting people a couple of factors yeah. to make a difference. Oh yeah. And that's that's one of the things that I get very excited about. You know, I said I really love olivine and, and I love to study it. And this is another cutting edge tool in our field, especially in volcano science globally. And so bringing it here to HVO, putting it to work and really testing it really rigorously to see if it works here um, is exciting. And I, I hope the students are excited too. Because <laughs> we can now do all of this in-house here at UHH. It's wonderful. What are you a geophysicist? Uh, <laughs> not a geophysicist. I dabble in math. <laughs> I dabble in math, um, but yeah, it's, it was one of the things that I was trained in specifically during my PhD and used during my postdoc in different ways to sort of expand the methodology and then bring here and, and see what we can do with it here at HVO. Yeah. Time for one more question? Really excellent questions. Uh, the, the BSC image training that's shown on this slide, the quick version of the method, um, I attempted to do shortly after the 2020 eruption, but didn't have enough time and manpower and help. Um, with the aid of undergraduate students that have been working with us, um, in the last six months, we've actually been able to ground truth this against a full data set. And I, I, my hope, my big hope, is that the next eruption, we can, we can really test this in a in sort of response environment and really say, okay, how quickly can we get this information? Good information, right? We don't want to sacrifice good data on the way to quick data, right? So that's the next test. Yeah. Thanks very much.